Hello, health psych students. Again, this is part one of your nutrition lecture. About to happen when I open the PowerPoint. All righty. Okay, you get to take a look at the joke first. Uh -huh. Okay, moving on. All right. If we had the clickers and I could survey you, I could ask you your diet identity. If you have an identity, there's an interesting thing happening culturally nowadays that a lot of times individuals are kind of identifying themselves um, in a way that is characterized by the rules and the guidelines and the ways that they eat. So somebody who's vegan, as an example, might, you know, that might be one of the things that they like to share with people. Um, there's paleo, people making deliberate healthy choices. That's really what we're going to focus on today in this lecture. Um, my dad used to joke about he followed the seafood diet, not meaning like a pescatarian, but more like if I see food, I eat it. Um, and then there are uh, people identifying with keto, doing the really low carb, high protein, high fat type of thing nowadays too. Okay, so we've had a really interesting thing that has happened in uh, the last hundred or so years in our history. Um, it was back in the 1940s that we had more in US problem of deficiencies. Um, and so we had individuals who couldn't get enough vitamin D, might develop with a bone disease called rickets, which is basically osteoporosis even before bones have formed in babies and kids. Um, lack of vitamin C would create this disease called scurvy. And then I don't know if you know the story of a lot of people on these sailing ships out there um, would develop scurvy because they didn't have access to uh, citrus fruit. And it wasn't until they discovered that if they could take out on the ships limes or lemons um, and allow those people to eat the limes and lemon, lemons over time, they would get enough vitamin Z C that they wouldn't develop scurvy. And then remember, they got called limeys. They, um, that was the term for those people sailing on those ships. Now, we had this huge thing happen. This is probably your great grand either grandparents, great-grandparents, or great-great-grandparents who went through the Great Depression in the United States where there was just food scarcity and poverty happening for, for more people than ever before. And because of that, we'll talk about some of the things that have been left over from the Great Depression that have actually trickled down into the mists nowadays here in a bit. Nowadays, we've got an interesting dilemma in what is happening in our culture. Um, there are people who have food deficiencies and nutrient deficiencies nowadays. Those are usually individuals that are victims of abuse or people that, uh, or kids that live in neglect that don't have access to a variety of healthy food. People with eating disorders sometimes suffer from new uh, diseases that are nutritional deficiencies. People with alcoholism, um, serious alcoholism, individuals will drink alcohol instead of eat, so then they're not getting much nutrition from their food. Plus, alcohol, particularly heavy alcohol consumption, interferes with several vitamin B absorptions in the body. So you get a double whammy with a severe alcoholism. You got the not eating and, and consuming nutrition, and then the alcohol interfering with nutrient um, absorption, and that can lead to a disease called Corsicos, which is an early onset dementia, as well as other physical health problems for people with alcoholism. Um, individuals with food poverty, uh, issues with food scarcity, we see that um, many rural areas, if they're agricultural areas and people are growing their own foods, then they will have access to those foods in farmer's markets. Um, but we are seeing a lot more of um, food deserts in rural areas where there's not uh, it's not an agricultural society. And then we've even got issues that have been uh, popping up recently with dollar stores popping up in these rural areas and a lot of individuals relying on more processed foods from a dollar general than if they were to go further to be, have access to a Walmart or uh, ordinary grocery store. Um, the Hunger Coalition in Boone um, uh, is a charity that uh, gives food to individuals who have food scarcity. And then also know that we've got East Hall for students. Um, there are quite a few students that actually run into issues of not being able to afford um, healthy food. Um, 
and if we were in session and not online, that would be open and available to everybody. I also want you to know that Dr. Amy Galloway, a professor in our department, she and I've done a little bit of research together. She teaches a conservation psychology course and um, a lot of the things that she talks about in psychology of how we can um, uh, be green and how we can grow food and transport food and consume food in a way that is healthier for us and our environment. She covers a lot of that stuff in her class. So we do have people with nutritional deficiencies and issues like that nowadays, but we actually are running into more of a problem in our culture um, with overabundance. Um, and so people are consuming um, as a nation, uh, too much fat, too much cholesterol, too much sugar, too many simple carbohydrates and, and sugar and processed foods would be an example of that. Too many calories, technically kilocalories, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, excessive alcohol intake, which has energy and problems that we've discussed a bit before. And poor fiber intake. And I, I love this um, Coca-Cola, honesty is the best uh, policy. Look at all of the issues that can come from overconsumption of sodas or pop if you all are not from the south okay i want us to do some comparison of what we're doing here in the united states relative to some of our other sister countries i've got kilocalories up here because technically scientifically when we when a lay person talks about consuming a calorie what that really translates into are a thousand calories so it's one kilocalorie so Anyways, so we're consuming more kilocalories than most of our sister countries. If you look here in the US in the middle column, we're consuming quite a bit of fat in our country. And we also consume a quite a bit of protein in our country. Now keep in mind that individuals who are consuming a lot of animal products, they're gonna be getting too much fat and too much protein from those animal products. And we're gonna, nutrition is com complicated, but one of the things that we're gonna talk about today is if we could simplify the complicated nature of our advice to individuals in the United States, it would be to cut back on their animal product consumption. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about protein myths here in a bit. Okay, so generationally, this interesting thing that has trickled down from our ancestors, particularly if they lived through the Great Depression and, um, and altered the way that they shop for food, cook food, eat food, a lot of the residual um, in the Great Depression continues in myths nowadays in the United States. So let's kind of walk through that. First of all, we've got a lot of pop nutrition versus good science out there when it comes to nutritional advice here in the United States. And then we have a lot of pop or popular weight loss diets too. Add to that, I think about this a lot when I'm in the grocery stores and I see this abundance of food and how much particularly um, produce is out there and fruit is out there. I, I just have this, this feeling of like, well, gosh, what a privilege to have all of that available to many of us, although it can be pricey, I know. But how much food we must waste because it's somehow impressive to consumers to have, I don't know, 100 oranges available instead of, I don't know, 10 oranges available if they sell 10 oranges a day. Um, so grocery stores in their competition with one another have added 400,000 items since the 1990s. And so most of us with that privilege have so much more available to us than we ordinarily would have in years past, but that adds an interesting cognitive burden to many of us. And the cognitive burden is that the average person, some cognitive scientists have looked at this, um, will make 200 plus food decisions a day. So not only like what to eat and when, how to cook it, how to not cook it, what to add to it, what not, um, what fast food store to go to, what to pick on the menu, that type of stuff. And it's no wonder that is a lot of decisions to be making. It's no wonder a lot of us go on this mindless autopilot pilot. Um, and you're gonna see later in the lecture, um, 
actually in the obesity lecture, Kelly Brownell, he's a researcher, a health psychologist up at, at Yale. And he talks about default options, that a lot of us cannot clearly make all of these decisions well every day. So we kind of go to this mindless autopilot or the default. It's like whatever's in front of us. So it's no wonder that fast food restaurants place themselves in busy intersections, as an example. If we are driving and we are hungry, there's a McDonald's default, pull into the McDonald's drive-through menu, what pops out at you at the menu. And a lot of us make these mindless decisions that way. And so somewhere in here, I just wanna make this statement when it comes to most people in the United States, most lay individuals, ignorance is common. But I really am using the term ignorance with its uh, literal definition. Ignorance meaning not educated, lacking in information, not ignorance as, as being stupid in any way, but ignorance as meaning I don't, I don't have the information. Um, and how do people know what they don't know? How do people know if they haven't been educated? How are you supposed to know? Um, but this kind of begs the question, um, we're, we're actually saying to be able to make really healthful choices when it comes to food, we need privilege, <laughs> we need resources, particularly financial resources, we need um, resources in terms of um, our ability to, um, to cook. Um, I'm sitting here in my kitchen, I got all of my cookbooks with me, some of my favorite ones with me. Um, JP's been hogging the sunroom, so I've been recording lectures in the kitchen today. Forks over knives, already showed you Afro vegan. I consider myself to be quite privileged to have the kitchen um, that we live in and to be able to have the appliances and to be able to have the things that we need to do um, to cook um, and to have the knowledge to be able to override that mindless stuff to be able to make healthy choices. Okay, so people in the United States are consuming too much fat and Put simply, they're consuming too much fat um, because they're consuming too many animal products. This is um, from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. So in Haines survey, um, and in Haines surveys people in the United States um, over and over again, it's an epidemiological surveillance program that allows us to kind of get a, a feel for what people are eating. This is for adults. Okay, so this is the, the types of food products where um, American adults are getting their most fat. So 7% is coming from hamburgers, cheeseburgers, and meatloaf, meat products. 6.4% is coming from hot dogs, ham, and lunch meat. And 6% for, uh, for adults is coming from whole milk. And I'm going to give my spiel here on milk here in a bit. All right. The pattern for children. We have this really interesting cultural thing happening um, where a couple of things are happening. First of all, it is recommended that we parents give our children for six months of their first six months of life breast milk, if at all possible, if it not at all possible, six months of formula fed milk, and then breastfeeding, partial breastfeeding or partial uh, formula plus solid foods introduced up until one year of life. We have a bit of a myth happening and the dairy industry has certainly fueled this that Kids need milk and teens need milk and women need milk to have strong bones. And that is just simply not true. Um, and we are weird and we're the only um, species that drinks another species milk. Um, we've got a, a cow, <laughs> there's a farm near where we live and there's a cow um, that I have found it fascinating. It seems like a bunch of adult cows, we've got pictures of little cows here, um, a bunch of adult cows continue to nurse off of this adult cow. <laughs> I'm assuming these are her former children that are now grown that have not been weaned, but it's just, it's a funny sight to see. And I chuckle every time I drive by it and I see that. Okay. So the pattern for kids is kids are getting too much fat from their milk, particularly if parents really feel like they need to be pushing the milk, you know, all the way through their teen years and that type of thing. So 26% of their dietary fat is coming from milk. And just to give you an idea, one glass of whole milk has as much fat as three slices of bacon. 13% of the kids are getting their dietary fat from the desserts, 9% from beef and 9% from pork 
put simply animal products for the adults and the children. Um, this is, um, I want to talk about myplate.gov. Myplate.gov used to um, picture their uh, nutritional guidelines in the food pyramid. I like the food pyramid um, where we've got whole grains and to be eaten very liberally at the bottom. After that, ideally we're consuming a bunch of fruits and veggies. I like that. Then we've got more limited amount um, towards the top of the pyramid of the, um, the meats and the dairy. And at the tippy top of the pyramid were the um, used very sparingly, simple sugars um, and whatnot. Um, I like the pyramid, um, but a lot of people found it to be confusing. But if you think about the typical American diet, so here's the recommendation. The typical American diet is the exact flip of that. Okay, very heavy in the animal products and the simple sugars um, and the simple fats and very light on the fruits and vegetables and very light on the whole grain. So I kind of like the pyramid. They have redesigned it now, myplate.gov, which are the US government guidelines. It's now in the shape of a plate and ideally what you've got um, in what proportion on your plate. So again, the majority ideally vegetables and grains, um, some fruit, some protein. I still chuckle when I see this American Dairy Council has been pretty powerful here because we still got our glass of milk over on the side. The thing I do like about these guidelines is though, and again, this is not the diet for absolutely everyone. I'm going to talk a little bit later in this uh, lecture on, for example, some of the scientific evidence for keto for uh, people with certain cancers and keto for people with um, seizure disorders. And that is very different from this kind of overall blanket recommendation for people in the United States. But what I like about this is that it is, uh, good nutritional advice for everybody, for, for children, for teenagers, for young adults, for elderly adults. It is uh, good recommendations for preventing cardiovascular disease, number one and number three cause of death. Good ed recommendations and advice for people trying to prevent cancer. It's good advice for people trying to um, cure themselves and treat themselves from disease. I've known a lot of individuals make dramatic changes in their diet after being diagnosed with cancer or um, cardiac rehab programs will focus on this after a heart attack, getting people to eat more healthfully. And so again, I want you to just sort of note that, that here's the food pyramid and the recommendations, but the typical American diet is the opposite. Um, most dietitians, registered dietitians work in advising people on how to get these proportions of these different food groups in food exchanges. Um, and just as an example, just sort of note that the, in exchange for a lot of these food groups is a small amount. And so depending on um, your dietary needs, your body size, how active you are, if you're an adult or you're a kid, dietitians can write out this plan where you're supposed to get, I don't know, 10 exchanges of grains a day and seven exchanges of vegetables a day. But just know that the serving sizes are small. So as an example, um, one slice of bread would be one grain. Most of us don't eat a sandwich with one slice of bread. We, you know, two slices, two servings, you got it. Okay. Um, morning consult here. Um, I've got a picture of the graph right here. What this was was simply a study where they surveyed nutritionists in the United States. So those that have the education and the information and they pitted that information against a survey of lay individuals. And keep in mind, you know, one of the themes here um, throughout this lecture is that a lot of people in the United States, lay individuals as opposed to professionals are just simply ignorant. They have not been educated and don't know what is healthiest for them. And so what they've done on this graph, you can look at the tippy top there, and we've got things like kale and spinach, eggs and nuts, avocado, lean chicken. This is one of the places where the registered dietitians and the experts and the lay people agreed. They agreed all of those kinds of foods are healthy, we should be consuming a lot of those kinds of things. And people had pretty good agreement um, with the dietitians down at the bottom. We shouldn't be consuming a whole lot of cookies, sodas, French fries, ice cream, bacon, that kind of stuff. Agreement on, yeah, that should be the stuff that we don't consume very much of. We're a lot of lay people 
um, disagreed with the uh, nutritionist though, is we, people think that fruit juices are really healthy for us. Ideally what we're doing is actually eating the raw fruit, getting the fiber, the nutrition, um, granola. A lot of people associate granola with this being like really healthy. Um, and it, the dietitians were saying, uh, uh, that's not true. Uh, you've got frozen yogurt here. The dietitians were going, uh, uh, that's not true. Uh, things like granola bars. A lot of lay people think that's really healthy to have as snacks. And the, the dietitians were saying, uh, not so much. Um, okay. So just it's kind of demonstrating disconnect between what a lot of people think is um, good for them and what the, the actual experts are saying in a lot of situations like this. So interventions for children, um, most children um, as a mode, mode being a metric for the most common number of servings per day, most kids in the United States are getting a mode of zero. Most kids are not getting vegetables in their food on most days. Um, the goal would be to increase uh, five exchanges of fruits and vegetables for kids. And then this sort of begs the question of where, where should kids be getting this supervision? And then this kind of begs issues with school breakfast and school lunches. Um, I want you to watch these two Jamie Oliver clips down here on your own. He really makes a point um, that Many of our public schools, they are bidding to these, these vendors out there and they bid for the cheapest food to mass feed the kids in their school district to try to save money on the limited tax money that they bring in for their schools. In doing it that way, um, and I don't necessarily know other ways of doing it, they end up finding that the cheapest food for the kids is oftentimes mass produced and the unhealthy food for kids. Um, so as an example, you'll see Jamie Oliver down here going, there's kids that are served sausage pizza for breakfast. He's like, I've never seen kids serve pizza for breakfast. Um, ideally for breakfast, uh, we're getting, I don't know, yogurt, fruit, um, uh, oatmeal, things like that, different types of things than um, pizza. It also sort of begs the question is what is the role of parents? We do know that parents who are educated, who have the information that buy food, prepare food, cook more food at home, their kids are fed more healthfully than parents who rely on fast food. And there is a really interesting generational gap in, and it's increasing in that middle class and upper class socioeconomic status individuals do more sit down restaurants and more shopping and preparing and cooking their own food at home, their kids eat more healthfully. Low SES, poor people are, uh, also we know poor neighborhoods as an example, have more fast food restaurants in them than upscale uh, neighborhoods. Um, schools that have fast food, the closer the proximity of fast food restaurants to a school system, you can predict the average body mass index, the average overweight of kids in that school district, the more fast food restaurants are closer to that school. Um, people who live in poverty or low SES rely a lot more on fast food eating and so you're more likely to see that whole family eating more poorly, more weight gain, more type two diabetes, more sedentary lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera, happening in those low SES as opposed to the middle income and the higher SES families. We also are at an interesting junction. If you've got time at home on your hands, which I know many of you don't right now, um, you're working, you're caretaking, that type of thing. But if you've got time, Learn how to cook if you've got food in your home. Watch some YouTubes, that type of stuff. Um, your generation right now knows how to prepare and cook food less than any previous generation. And there's an interesting familial thing that happens that when there's an adult or two adults in the home that uh, cook on a regular basis and show their children how to cook, those children are gonna grow into adults and do more cooking for themselves, they're gonna show their kids, et cetera. So in that generational kinds of thing, based on predicting by SES, we've got just some really interesting um, things happening. We've got a lot of people out there don't know 
how to cook these days. Um, one of my friends is a dietitian, and I remember her telling me about a consult she had with a young man in college, and she was having him keep track of his food because he was there for medical reasons and needed to um, improve his nutrition. And he comes back with his log, and it was scrambled eggs, scrambled eggs, scrambled eggs, scrambled eggs. And she commented to him in something like, wow, you really like scrambled eggs, don't you? And his response was, no, I'm sick of scrambled eggs. It's the only thing I know how to cook. And so she had lots of work and lots of things that she was able to help him to do. Um, fast food laws is another thing. There are certain states that actually add those disincentives tax to fast food so that fast food costs um, more. I have some, I have problems with that in my own heart though, because if fast food is all that is available for a lot of individuals who are lower in SES, I wouldn't want the food to get so expensive that they couldn't necessarily afford it. I think a better way of going would be, and Michelle Obama, when she had Let's Move as a first lady in the White House in the previous administration, her big project was let's move and she would invite kids to the white house and she developed a vegetable garden and we know that kids that grow up um, growing their own food whether it be um, animals or plants are a lot more likely um, to consume more healthful food if they've seen like where it's come from and that type of thing but in her let's move part another thing that michelle obama did was negotiate with walmart in particular to help them bring the price of fresh fruits and vegetables down to make that stuff more affordable to individuals who normally wouldn't be purchasing fresh fruits and vegetables. I think you all know if you can go into the grocery store, the, the best way of picking your foods are on the perimeter. Um, the perimeter are going to be the foods that are less processed in the middle and the frozen and the processed stuff is going to be the stuff that is less healthy. Fruits and vegetables are expensive, especially if you feel a need to purchase organic. Organic fruits and vegetables are even more expensive than uh, normal fruits and vegetables. Some of that expense, again, going back to that thing, that observation that I made, um, that we waste so much food in the United States with these grocery stores competing with one another. It's just kind of a shame we've gotten to that. Um, if we didn't waste so much, um, it wouldn't necessarily have to be so expensive. So I do want you to watch Jamie Oliver. I want you to um, pay attention to where he was successful in uh, the LA high schools in at least getting the LA, um, not high schools, all the school system, um, to stop serving flavored milk. Kids think they need milk. Remember, that's one of these myths. So you're supposed to be drinking milk all the time. Kids prefer if they are given the option of getting a flavored milk, a chocolate milk, a strawberry milk over a white milk. Kids will oftentimes purchase the flavored milk and then the flavored milk has all this added sugar in it. And so you're getting this, this fluid product that you don't need and then you're getting all these simple sugars um, added to it. So what... One of the things he was able to do is get the flavored milk out of the schools. Jamie Oliver is a chef. He's an entertainer. I've got a couple of clips here. I've got some clips um, coming up later or in later lectures um, that I can show you. Okay. Um, fat and meat and milk. We've already talked about people getting a lot of their dietary fat from animal products. 97% um, fat-free meat, just as an example. A lot of times we think that's per calories, but for the meat labels, it's per the volume, it's per the weight of the meat. And keep in mind that most of the meats that uh, US people like to eat are muscle meats. So like chicken breast would be a muscle meat, um, as an example. And meat is protein and a lot of water, and those things combined makes meat heavy. Okay, so when it says 97% fat free, that doesn't mean it's 3% of its calories from fat. It means it's 3% of um, fat per the weight of that product. Milk, just want to talk a little bit about um, milk here, um, eight ounces of milk. Uh, whole milk has 146 kilocalories, nine, um, about eight grams of fat. 2% milk, 122, about five grams of fat. Skim milk, 86 kilocalories. Uh, 0.4 grams of fat. You are going to think I've got issues with milk. I certainly want to educate people about this kind of myth issue in the in the U.S., um, but I'm not anti-milk. Um, I, I tell everybody who knows me, like on my deathbed, on my deathbed, I want people to feed me chocolate glazed donuts I want to be drinking chocolate milk around the clock, you know, and, you know, on my deathbed again, you know, if I am I'm going, I'm going to go out and enjoy 
the milk and the donuts, throwing a little ecstasy and some other drugs I probably shouldn't have done all my life just to see what it's like on the deathbed. All right, some words about the ketogenic diet because a lot of people doing keto nowadays. Technically, you would think it'd be keto, but in the US, we call it keto. In keto, there's very low carb diets. So it's very low carb, cutting out simple carbs, but then even being careful careful with some limitation of even complex carbohydrates from, um, you see up here, different vegetables like uh, zucchini, avocado, avocado has a lot of natural fat too, kale, asparagus, that type of thing. And the very low carb, remember from the diabetes lecture, we talked about how our cells and the brain um, the brain especially likes glucose for energy. But if you consume very low carb after a couple of days, and a lot of people who go on keto, they'll call those first couple of days of conversion. There's even a saying for keto flu. It's not a, it's not a pathogen flu. It's just people feeling yucky. It can be for some when the keto flu where you your body realizes it doesn't have enough carb you're not get, consuming enough glucose and then the body moves over and the liver starts making these ketones for energy um, and the ketones can be used in the brain it takes a few days for some people in that conversion for the brain to be able to burn the ketones to feel like you get your brain back um, and then the body is more likely to be able to efficiently burn ketones burn body's own stored fat um, which is why a lot of people are doing um, keto for weight loss. Um, and so then the body learn, the body learns how to burn protein and fat more efficiently instead of relying on glucose um, for its energy. And if you think about it in terms of evolution, this adaptation makes a lot of sense because all throughout evolution, the problem was not an overabundance of food like we have now. All throughout evolution, the problem was not having enough food, going through famines, going through starvation. We're gonna talk about this in the obesity lecture. Obesity genes, there are all kinds of genes that encourage us to, be, to store body fat and become obese. And that makes a lot of sense because that was an evolutionary adaptation all around the world in our genome to keep us alive long enough to be able to live and reproduce in uh, human evolution. Also throughout human evolution, there were a lot of times where people did not have access to regular food intake. So their body would have to go into a fasting condition and this keto, um, burning ketones for energy as a part of that fasting condition. Um, also, there were probably a lot of times throughout human history where there were people do, who just didn't have availability of carbohydrate. So all they were um, had um, were stored uh, meat, for example, or they would hunt for meat. So there is research to suggest that um, the keto diet is effective for weight loss. And this particular meta-analysis, which is a study of studies, they actually found people following pure keto, so real low carb, um, lost more weight than people following very low fat diets, um, lost more weight, had better blood pressure and better blood fats than the people on the very low fat diet. So there is some um, data out there. There are also some interesting literature on... Um, People with seizure disorders um, who go on keto um, are more effectively able to manage their um, manage their seizures. And then some cancers, if you starve the body of glucose, some cancers must rely on glucose for their own energy and their own uh, cell replica replication. So there's some cancers out there that can be starved and decrease if people are starving themselves of simple carbohydrates and glucose. But again, if you kind of take a look at the picture up at the top right, we're still talking about a lot of plant-based foods um, and fish um, and eggs, but not necessarily um, unhealthy foods for people doing this. So the food components, um, our food contains carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, minerals. I'm gonna take you one slide at a time through those. So carbohydrates, um, there are simple and complex. Ideally, we human beings are consuming complex carbohydrate foods and being very careful not to overconsume simple carbohydrates. Um, and so you see a lot of like whole grains here. You see a lot of the fruits and veggies over here in these pictures. And then there are different ways that we can get carbohydrate. 
want to talk about the glycemic index here. This is applicable, especially for people with diabetes, but it can be applicable to all of us and especially even individuals that are kind of prone to um, episodes of low blood sugar. In the glycemic index, ideally we are consuming a lot of these foods up at the top, leafy green veggies, apples, beans, other legumes, oatmeal, sprouted grain, that type of stuff. Those carbohydrate, high carbohydrate foods are going to result in slow release of glucose in the bloodstream. And so it's going to feed us a slow, steady, steady form of energy. On the bottom here, these would be the carbohydrates that ideally we are avoiding or being careful. Fruit juices, I've already talked about, ideally would do better with raw fruit and not necessarily um, juicing it. Pretzels, desserts, chip soda, candy, table sugar. Those foods are going to have a blast of glucose into the bloodstream very quickly after consumption. And there's not much fiber in those foods and fiber helps slow down digestion. So another reason why the complex carbohydrates gently kind of sustain into um, the digestive system and into the blood glucose there. Big bursts of blood glucose into the bloodstream for some people creates an overreaction of insulin. And if insulin overreacts, then that glucose very quickly gets pulled into the cells. Blood glucose levels are going to first spike overreaction insulin and then tank. And then that individual is like, oh my gosh, I'm hungry again. And if they're relying on unhealthy choices for the original reason why they were hungry, after they spike and then they decrease, they usually rely on those choices over and over again. It's not a good habit. So um, people with diabetes in particular are advised and coached to consume the complex and it's just good advice for everybody. Okay, I want you to watch um, uh, this other clip of Jamie Oliver's um, solution. And I am going to pause now and consider this to be part one of the nutrition lecture. I will see you all again in a bit. 